Oh, which one do I press? So, yeah. Yeah. No, Oh, okay. What's up? Hello, guys. Good. Cool. So my name's Evan. I'm sure I met most of you guys. Um, okay, so the way things are going to go is um, I really wanted to pick on you guys, but I don't know enough of your names. And there's going to be questions in here, yeah? So I'm thinking that I pick on one of you guys. After you answer the question, you pick on someone else in the audience. So everyone stays awake for my um, hour and a half long lecture. Also, how confident are you guys feeling about um, infectious disease and antibiotics? Like, no? Good. Because if I have like a few minutes at the end, I'll try to do like a quick five minute thing on infectious disease. That's okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, my slides are on clinical skills. It's the rundown. Oh, that's not great. Um, well, it's the one at the bottom. Um, and it was like a lot of marks compared to the rest. How many marks? Um, 20 marks to be exact. And um, yeah, so pay attention. <laughs> Last year's OSCE stations, the one that's that covered right now is endocrine, the endocrine exam. But um, if I were to say something about these, um, the blood pressure cuff didn't work for the blood pressure station, so that wasn't great. But um, the rest were not too bad. Um, there, was a, there was a gastro history that was actually disguised as, it wasn't actually a cage history, so you had to ask alcohol and you had to ask cage. So a lot of us, including me, got burned. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but everything else was, yeah, it was not too bad, not too bad. I'll run through how to do like a nice heme history as well. So rest, just breathe, just breathe. Okay, um, it's a systems review. I'm sure you guys are well familiar with it. Um, basically, all I need you guys to know is ask about a cough and then quantify that cough, characterize that cough, ask about blood in that cough, ask about sputum in that cough, and then ask about shots of breath. Ask about what it sounds like and when it is. Just all the WWQQ other stuff about shortness of breath and then systemics because everyone who has a cough also probably has a fever because they're always going to be like a dirty or something. Upper respiratory, yeah, upper respiratory tract infection. Um, yeah, like 90% or 80% of shortness of breath cases are just dirty. GP land. Um, yep, yeah, so that's just an interview. First question. I'm sorry, um, C spine, C spine collar guy. You walked in and it's so memorable. First question goes to you, man. Have a read, have a discuss between yourselves. I'll give you like, I don't know, a couple of seconds. Hey, I know it is. Can we, can we like comment to meet these guys? I don't know how to It's kind of hard. Yeah, C, nice. So this is your classic Horner syndrome, which um, Monash loves, and it's buzzword for Panko's tumor. Why is that? Well, Panko's tumor sits at the apex of your lung, and that's why it can obstruct things, so leading to your thoracic outlet syndrome, but in this case, it's disrupting your um, sympathetic chain with cervical ganglion, leading to your meiosis and hydrosis <laughs> and um, chemosis. Yeah. Um, so, and the almanav also runs through that, which is why you get your wasting of your hypothesis. Do you find a guy? Do you have anyone to nominate? <laughs> Next one's yours. There's a... Fair few buzzwords, but I'm not sure if it's ear two or ear three level buzzword. So, source. E, yep, TB. Um, so, yep, this is apical consolidation, which is where TB likes to um, habitat. And caseating granulomas is a path buzzword, but it's more for next year, I guess, because we're the ones with the huge path exam. Oh. 
Um, and yeah, weight loss, hemoptysis, that might point you towards cancer, but in this case, because of the fevers pumping that, you'd be more thinking infective causes and TB infective, and it has weight loss and stuff in it. So, woo, TB. Actually, no, not woo TB. Um, bonus question, what's the treatment? I, I just need like one four letter word. Yeah, sweet, right. That's all I need from you. And that's it there. Can you guys see that upper lobe consolidation? Uh, it's just tough. Um, Alex, Alex? Yes, big person. Tom. Um, not great that <laughs> some of the diagnoses are covered up. Can I move that? No, I can't move it. Well, the other, diag um, the other two are like in fact, in interstitial lung disease and the other one's pneumonia. What was that? Just getting out of it? How do I get out of it? I like this. Yeah, that one. Yeah, look. <laughs> wow, yeah, asthma. Um, so what's important here to look at is um, the pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator, and the predicted values, the percentage, yeah? So for asthma, you expect to see an obstructed picture. So you expect the FEV1 to be much lower than predicted. So you see how it's 2.8, 2.18, compared to 3.4, whatever. And then post-bronchodilator, it's increased. It's a good thing. And it's increased by 30%. Yeah, 30%. And we want, and um, our diagnosis of asthma, we want it to be above 12% increase post bronchodilator or above 200 milligrams, uh, milliliters. So yeah, asthma, Woo. pick someone. Ruby, give me some causes of dry cough. I only need like one, a specific drug perhaps. Yeah, yeah, dry cough. I heard ACE inhibitor. I'm letting you off the hook. Um, ACE inhibitor. Um, you can also get like an RT, gives you a dry cough. An atypical pneumonia would give you a dry cough. All important things in your OSCEs when someone's like, oh, I got a dry cough. And you're like, aha, ACE. Um, wet cough, anyone? So if a dry cough's an RT, an upper respiratory tract infection, a wet cough, a lower, yeah, a lower risk rich tract infection. And yeah, COPD also, especially if you get an infective exacerbation. So that's like you get an infection on top of your pre existing COPD. You get a wet cough because of all that gunk. Um, whooping cough. I don't know, I don't know what a whooping cough is. That's too, that's too peedsy. Um, yeah, pertussis. It's just a thing. Worse at night though, that's kind of important. So you're lying down at night. I, I, oh yeah, I, I'm asleep at night. What, um, so white coughs would be worse at night. Asthma, yeah. Asthma, um, asthma has a characteristic like time of day. It's like either 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. at night. And it's just the worst thing ever. And also God gives you a cough because it's like oh, everything creeps back up. When you're lying down, yeah, gross. Um, barking cough is croup, which is also a Pete's condition. You guys don't really need to know it. I don't really need to know it either. <laughs> Moving on, sputum. Well, Monash buzzword land. Yellow green sputum is bronchiectasis. Yep. Um, a clear gray sputum is probably. I heard asthma. Um, yeah, like a non infective cause, asthma, COPD. Yeah. Pink frothy is super rare in the actual condition, but Monash loves it as a buzzword, so. The silence is deafening. Um, it's heart failure. Pulmonary edema, which is an acute exacerbation of said heart failure. And blood in your speeder, just go to the emergency department straight away. GPs can't do much about it. Um, it's, it's just badness. TB, cancer, pulmonary embolisms, all things bad. 
Cool. Causes of clubbing. I'm not too sure how much of this you need to know, but like there's a gazillion causes of clubbing. And if you know a couple for each system, it's probably a good idea because they like to throw a multiple choice question, like patient presents with something, something, something plus clubbing. And you're like, okay, clubbing, it's a chronic condition. It's probably inflammatory or cancery. COPD, not a cause of clubbing. Um, what else is kind of odd here that you guys wouldn't know? Atrial myxoma, that's a benign tumor in the atrium of the heart. Super rare, but when Ash likes it. Um, malabsorption, kind of, kind of CFE. Graves has a specific name for it. Thyroidacropathy that you guys, I'm sure, have come across in your endocrine clinical skills treats. Um, yep. Okay, tracheal deviation. I want uh, Karan. Tension pneumo. Which way does it go? Away? Yeah. Pick someone. Spontaneous. Which way does it go? Towards. Yeah. Pick someone. So, hey, wait, who did you say? Sinet, <laughs> lung collapse, which way? Good, pick someone. Who was it? Go for it. Atelectasis, yep, yep. Atelectasis is usually a post-op procedure, but so you know how post-op, you'd be like lying in your tummy um, for a long time, and then your lungs aren't, as breath aren't breathing as hard? They're not doing as much work, especially if you're on like airway ventilation and stuff. So um, stuff just gets like stuck at the bottom of your lung to make it hard for you to breathe. It's usually the buzzword for that is it clears with coughing. So if you cough all the stuff out, like your lungs have more room to move around and stuff. Um, yeah, makes sense. Cool. Um, Aphylaxis is something you'll see a lot more often next year when you're actually in hospital. All of these things you'll see more next year when you're actually in hospital. Um, okay, pleural effusion. Did you pick anyone? Yeah, pick someone. Fibrosis. Let's go towards, I heard you. Okay, so the kind of like, how I like to think about it is if it's fibrosing, it's kind of like creeping and like, it's like fibrous tissue, yeah? And then it like hugs your trachea, well not hug, but like kind of like venom, like grabs onto your trachea and then just pulls on it. So it's pulling it towards itself. Same with a collapse, it's pulling it towards it because collapse means, it's like if you're in space, like there's a vacuum, yeah? So it pulls the trachea towards the vacuum. Um, and if there's a pleural effusion, that's like consolidation, pushing it away. Cool. Um, this is going to take forever if I do everything um, because I have like <laughs> legitimately every single condition. Um, okay. I'll just go through these ones. Hyperresonant. So there's nothing there. Decreased breath sounds. So you can't hear anything. There's no breathing going on. So it's a pneumothorax. Dull percussion, but still absent breath sounds means lung collapse. Yep. Stony dullness. Monash buzzword for pleural effusion. Yeah. Cool. Um, and have absent breath sounds because it, you can't hear anything because of the, all the water, all the water slash serous fluid slash blood slash whatever it is. Um, resonant percussion, vesicular breath sounds. That's what you guys should all be saying in your OSCEs because that's normal breathing. Bronchial breath sounds slash crackles slash dullness is pneumonia slash consolidation, because that's what you see on x-ray. Cool. Moving on <coughs> with our lives. Oh my God. Um, do, you guys, do you guys want to do a speed run of this? Um, Press in the front. We're going to go across this row. HPOA. It's on your lung, lung um, OSCE, no, not OSCE, clean skills workbook thing. Yeah, yeah, it's tenderness on the wrists. Yeah, what's it sign off? Skin cancer, sweet. Lung cancer even, not skin cancer, weird. Um, tracheal tug, trapeding. Yeah, COPD, you'll see that a lot in the hospital. This is a real niche buzzword, um, but it's worth it, trust me. 
you'll hear it. Um, it's in full interstitial lung disease or interstitial fibrosis. Which one? You didn't get away from me. Go. What's that asana? Huh? See it to your attention? I had that. Say. Say. What is that disease called? First, first one in PBL. First year PBL, yeah? Cystic fibrosis. There was a movie about that recently. It was so narrow. But yeah. Um, person next to you. What's the atopic triad? You got, I can see the amount of people. What? What'd you say? Yep, asthma, eczema, allergies, hay fever. Um, this is kind of hard, so I'm just gonna run through it. Also, I see the amount of people jumping on the on the day when skills like you guys are. Okay, so imagine the Nemo. No one, none of you guys in this room, including me, are ever gonna do one until you're like at least an internal rage, but just just in case. Um, so second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, depending on which side um, has the decreased breath sounds, because you don't want to actually puncture the good lung. Um, that'd be bad. Still. Like, like savable, but bad. Savable, but bad. Um, um, so, oh, I'm getting into this one. Okay, I see. So, thoracosynthesis. So, that's when you're doing a pleural tap for a pleural effusion. You just want to get at about like one or two intercostal spaces below the actual meniscal line. And you can see that on the x ray. You can see that meniscal shape. Speaking of x rays, this is here. Have a read. We, got, we had to interpret x rays. And um, my approach is. Skip that, whatever. Um, skip that. Okay, my approach is, so say the person's name. This is the x-ray of blah. Um, it's a PA x-ray. It's taken on the right day. And then you talk about the salient finding. What's the salient finding here? It's a right upper lobe consolidation. We don't go for pneumonia because we don't know what the cause of that consolidation is yet. So we just say consolidation or opacity. Opacity is a better word because that's what we see in opacity. Um, how do I know it's a right upper lobe? Well, there's no middle lobe for right lung. And see that dullness here? You'd see whiteness here if it was a lower lobe. And then after I found a salient abnormality, I go across my order of like right, like rotation, inspiration, positioning, exposure, whatever, and the ABCDs. Yeah, does that make sense, everyone? Good, I had an overall yes. Oh, wow. I'm only on GI. Ha, okay. Systems review. It's here. Have a read about it. Abdominal pain is all you really care about. And um, nausea, vomiting, important. Blood in your vomit, very important. Um, and change in bowel habits. Always think colorectal, colorectal cancer if it's like an old 50 year old male or something. Cool. We have EMQs. Yay. Um, who do I pick on? Sarah Broom. We'll pick on you. First question. Feel free to go back to the EMQ. These are the options for that question, if that what did make sense. What's the answer? C? C. I like C as well. Cost of status. Um, you guys might be like, oh, but he's jaundiced. But jaundiced, the shark has tried, jaundiced right up a quadrant pain and a fever. That's for cholangitis. And you might not necessarily have jaundice with cholecystitis because the stones in the gallbladder, and that's why you get your classic biliary colic pain because a stone dislodges, or relodges, dislodges, relodges. And this person also has like the classic risk factors for cholecystitis, like 40 female, fat, um, not fair, but um, yeah, fertile because I don't know, young age, youngish age. Um, and positive Murphy is also very cold society. Second question. Pick someone, Sarah. Person next to you. Thrown under the bus. Um, 
Painless joint, it's an H. Yep, do you know what sign that is? Kawazier's sign. It's basically like, if you have an old person with painless jaundice, there's something sinister going on. It's going to be cancer. Okay, um, pick someone. Wow. Go. Mystery meat. Gastro. Yeah. Person just has a good old, good old case of gastro. Self-resolving, please don't give anyone antibiotics for gastro. It's not worth their time or your time, especially your time. Um, okay, next question. We're gonna pick on Jasmine. It's in the scrotum. So what's the plan? Indirect, yeah, B. So do we know what all of these um, options are actually? I, I know the picture says direct hernia, but it's indirect, trust me. Okay, so it's in the scrotum, yeah? So it's gone through both the deep ring and the superficial ring and ended up in the scrotum. And because it's a cough impulse, that means it's a hernia. And because he's male, this is very like um, stereotyping, but med is stereotyping. Um, males get inguinals, fem femorals are more females, and it's like below the inguinal ligament versus above the inguinal ligament is femoral or inguinal. Um, yeah, so that's the pathway of the indirect, and the direct would just punch straight through uh, medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. Um, do you guys know what a saphena barracks is? It's like a venous, it's like a venous hernia, basically. It's more common in people who have like varicose veins, or portal hypertension and it usually disappears when you're lying down and a hydrocele is just you guys know what hydrocele is yeah sweet i'm not gonna go through that yeah abdominal pain this you guys should know the entirety of this picture plus more so you should know like which quadrant equals what thing is wrong with them um most importantly for you guys would probably be like right upper quadrant pain, just like gallbladder plus liver. Um, always keep in the back of your mind cardiac causes as well because the inferior MI can radiate down to and present as epigastric pain. Um, right iliac fossa pain you should know as appendicitis. But you guys will learn more about Crohn's next year, which like also presents right there. And in fourth year you learn about mesenteric adenitis, which is like a peds condition. And Appendicitis also is like presents in younger people, yeah? So it's like a common differential for appendicitis. Um, yeah, WWQQAAs for uh, appendicitis. I've learned this year to always ask what the patient thinks it is because the patient will almost always be like, I think it's the cancer that I have reoccurring from like way gone. And you never asked about it if they had a cancer previously. So you're like, oh, thank you so much. Here's my diagnosis. Wow, you're, I'm a genius. Okay. Um, just difference between dinophagia and dysphagia, in case people weren't clear. Dysphagia is difficulty, and dinophagia is actual pain on swallowing, unless some causes for each. Um, BMI versus waist hip. Well, yeah, waist hip ratio. Um, we still use BMI in the hospitals, but studies have come out saying that waist hip ratio is probably a better thing because it takes into account people who have like muscle instead of fat. Yeah? Okay. Um, cool. We have more questions. Yay. Um, we will go with person clicking. Beck. Beck? Yes. First question goes to you. Yeah. Sweet. Pick someone. No, no, pick someone. Yeah, sign off. Pancreatitis, yeah. Tenderness, third distance, yeah, pick someone. Yeah, and the sign is? It's a point, it's a McBurney's point. Um, yep, it's a third from your aces to your umbilicus. It's where the appendix likes to sit, but it's super general because you're a Everyone's appendix sits somewhere else. 
but it's just generally around the right iliac fossa area. Um, pick someone. Wow, she really threw you under the bus. You are on palpable gallbladder, mild painless jaundice. I said it before, yeah. if that helps. Yeah, Kaposias, sign of pancreatic cancer. Oh, shit. <laughs> we saw that one, Collins. Um, pick someone. You hold all the power. As in for this one, pick, pick, pick someone. Yeah, cross um, also called Robson's sign, and it's a sign of acute appendicitis. Um, nutritional deficiencies, like it may or may not come up, I just put it up in case it comes up. Um, complications are important to know, and signs of said complications are also important to know. Yeah, cool. Um, I've seen so many people do shifting downwards wrong, including me, um, and a renal guy at Trowden corrected me, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna perform it in front of you so you can see. So you basically start here, you work your way across, and then you mark it. So either you get to the patient to um, hold their finger there, or you like draw on it, like use a marker or something to draw it on the spot, and then you get them to turn onto their right side. Yeah, wait 30 seconds, or like say that you will wait 30 seconds for the fluid if the fluid to move down. Um, and then you tap on it again. If it's dull, it means it was a mass there. But if it's resonant, it means the fluid's shifted down. And so, so like really obvious if the fluid shifted down because like all, you'll just see the fat and everything's it's just yuck. But yeah, you'll see all that jazz. Um, and while you're there, you can also percuss for the spleen. So I like to do them both at the same time rather than like percussing the spleen, percussing the spleen, and then giving them to the rollover and then all back and then roll over again. Such a waste of time, but yeah, so that's shifting down this renal. Don't punch kidneys, learn the hard way. Okay, um, you. your answer is don't look over there, that's you. It's kind of hard, I think. Oh, shit. yeah, let's define butter. <laughs> She's deliberating. She says B. Is the answer B? I think the answer is B. That's B. Look at you go. Damn. Um, so the difference between here is whether the lesion is above S1, I'd like to say. Basically above T12 or whether it's in the S2 to S4 area. So if it's above T12, the reflex arc is still intact. So you'll have a reflex butter versus if it's below, the reflex arc is not intact. So you won't have a reflex. And the reflex is actually like the detrusor muscle reflex. So if the detrusor feels liquid building up, it relaxes, so it's a constant relaxation versus there's no reflex arc, so the flaccid bladder, where the detrusor can't do anything about the um, urine building up, so it just builds up, builds up, builds up, and just flows over. So it's overflow incontinence. Yeah, yeah, cool. Pick someone. This <laughs> is so much fun. Hitting friends against each other. So she has dysuria, frequency, and a tiny bit of microscopic blood. D, yeah, trimethoprim. That's all you guys really need to know about UTIs. UTI equals trimethoprim. Empirical, and if like it's a recurrent UTI, you give like prophylactic trimethoprim. Whatever, and it, yeah, that's all you guys need to know. We'll move on. Pick someone. Oh, this is hard. You better. You gotta pick someone <laughs> and like risk losing their friendship out of it.
B, B. Okay, so I realized I could drunk man, which might make you guys think the future is contracture, but the provisional diagnosis is CKD. And, um, hi Kai. And, <laughs> um, it's the buildup of pruritus, oh, the buildup of urea that causes the itching. That's the thing that's seen in chronic kidney disease. Palm erythema, that's a GI cause, chronic liver disease. Um, pancreas tumor for that one, we discussed that. Jane lesions is uh, Jane lesions is an embolic sign seen in um, infective endocarditis, which will come up. So remember that for soon. Oh my god, I'm running out of time. Okay, um, pick someone. Think fast. Good. What's up? Bladder reflex up. It's um so it's basically the detrusor stretch muscle reflex, yeah. So basically, instead of having to go all the way to the brain and be like, oh my bladder is full, oh I need to empty it, and then you have like you have that like need to pee, yeah. That's your reflex arc. But because of your external urethral sphincter, which is controlled by your somatic system, you don't actually wet your pants on the spot, you good or child, yeah. And then you allow yourself to go. So that's like the limiter to that reflex up. Cool. Um, I give you time, Max. What'd you say? Nephritic syndrome, you are correct. Um, does that make sense? So, oh, bonus question if you know which nephritic syndrome. I'm, okay, cool. You guys don't even know this right now, but like by next band and next year, you'll need, like, you'll need to know every single nephritic and nephritic syndrome. Like, it'll seem like hell right now, because it is hell right now, and it was hell, and we did it. <laughs> Pap made you learn it. Um, yeah, Thea Pap. Okay, so Frankie Maturia, hypertension, and a recent ERTI in a young-ish person, very nephritic syndrome. Um, past, like, the ERTI was a couple of days ago, so I would say this is IGA nephropathy. But, um, yeah, that's nephritic syndrome. Sister... <laughs> This is so funny. Um, systems review. I like to split mine into pain, P, P, so all the P's, pain. Is there any pain? Lunch grind pain, renal colic. Easy. Um, if they're running in the bed, can't sit still, renal colic. P, amount, frequency, character, blood. Blood, 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 because bladder cancer is a thing. Um, big boy prostate. <laughs> um, just like old men who have trouble going, have erectile dysfunction. They just have BPH. You always need to put a stick finger in there. Like whenever the prostate's concerned, stick a finger in. We have stick to waiting fingers. <laughs> yeah, you guys will just have to do it for your logbook next year. Um, incontinence, that's the neurogenic bladder stuff. UTI, you went through that. CKD, went through it. You, you'll need to learn the science, yeah? I like to quantify my renal history down into like buzz, um, like what's it called when you, Cram questions. Category cluster questions. Yeah, cluster questions. Nice. Um, it's what we're supposed to do this year. But try to do it this year um, and your year as well. Um, I'm not going to go through that. Anuria, oliguria, polyuria. I'm sure you guys know that by now. Um, frothy urine is bacterial slash yuckness. Um, pink red, hematuria. Um, dark brown. What is dark brown? Oh, urobilinogen. It's like dark brown pale stools, like dark urine pale stools, called static picture. Got jaundice, perhaps. And it's always nice to know like, which drugs cause a different colored pee. Like, you'd be like pissing red, but you're like, oh, that's because I have TB and I'm on rapamycin. That makes sense. I'm not dying of bladder cancer. Wow. So, know that. Um, examination notes. Yeah, look, I'm sure you guys have practiced for your OSCEs. When's your OSCEs, by the way? Woo! Mine's later. 
but mine actually count. Um, you're an artist. This was a session that came up last year. Please don't vote like that one guy who likes, was like, how do I get this urine onto this piece of paper? Oh, I know what. I'll just drop it onto that piece of paper. <laughs> examiner was not happy. Um, and also, don't be like me and forget to start, start your stopwatch. Because I was like, 30 seconds into this thing going, and I was like, oh shit, I don't know what the time is. <laughs> so I had to like, start my stopwatch in the middle of it, and it wasn't pretty, but it was, that's fine, I passed. It's fine. Um, yeah, so just do all that, comment on a macroscopic picture, and then read this Jerry strip thingy, and be like, oh, th there's urea in it. This is all the stuff that you really interpret. I just put it up there because, like, you should know that, or you might need to know that. Um, specific gravity doesn't count. I don't care about that. Everything else, yeah, important. And do, oh, money on and do. Um, it's just a lot of stuff. Endo is usually the one that's like, if it's nothing else, it's probably something wrong with your endocrine system, your hormones going way out of whack, all that jazz. Um, split it up into your hyperthyroid symptoms, hypothyroid, because it's like for your level, you're only expected to know thyroid conditions, I guess, yeah. Um, oh, like, and pituitary adenoma symptoms, like prolactinoma, or like uh, acromegaly because of growth hormone excess, stuff like that. Thyroid exam. Um, Look, I'll skip that. It's there for you if you need it. Um, how to like appropriately, appropriately how to do it. Yep, I had it was amazingly easy, so I'm gonna skip that. Thanks. <laughs> and you get to you get to do the first one. Cushings, yeah. This guy's probably had way too much pred. That's like the most common cause of Cushings. Or like, you had an actual Cushings disease. So like, there's ACTH being spread everywhere. Um, pick someone. <coughs> yep, acromegaly. Um, does that make sense? So you have growth hormone issues. Acromegaly is usually an adult onset thing. So you're like, you've already finished growing. So your long bones don't extend, but your like tiny fingers and feet and like jawline, they all like get huge. Um, and that's, so you have a, a adenoma. So you have growth hormone excess later in life. And if it's early in life, we call that gigantism and your long bones extend. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Um, Kavi, you're doing the next question. Yeah, pay attention. Um, cold intolerance, lethargy, depression. Oh, a buzzword, out of half eyebrow. Hypothyroidism, sweet. Happy with that, everyone? Yeah, everything's depressed, cool. Pick someone, Kavi. <laughs> Polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, atrophy. Atrophy. I'm not going to do hyper and hyper at the same time. That's dumb. Yes, you'll have to know this one like the back of your hand by the end of this year. Because like everyone expects, like so many people have diabetes in, like not here, but in the hospitals. So you should know this one. Like, like yeah. And it's because of the increased glucose that you have the polyuria, polydipsia, because you're peeing so much out, you're thirsty constantly. Um, next person, pick someone. Ben. Addison's, yes. Hyperpigmentation, the fatigue. You also have like a postural hypotension. That's very addison -y. It's a primary hypoaldosterone, uh, hypo, um, ADH? Yeah, yeah. Um, ism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick someone. Mark. Hyperthyroidism. There you go. It came back. It's just the opposite of hyperthyroidism. Everything's overactive. Increased metabolism. Shit, all over the place. Legitimately, because they have diarrhea. <laughs> Next person. 
hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, your bones, moans, stones, groans, psychological overtones on the throne because you have constipation. Woo! Good job, guys. I know everyone hates this, so I'm just I'm just gonna explain it so it's not as bad, yeah? Okay, okay, cool. Cool. Get ready to be amazed. Dexamethasone acts on your hypothalamus slash pituitary axis, yeah? So it only affects your pituitary gland. So if you have hypercholesterolemia, so you have high cortisol in your blood, yeah? Cortisol is produced by your adrenal gland, yeah? So if you have high cortisol and low ACTH, it means the um, adrenal glands producing all your serum cortisol and because of the negative feedback loop, your ACTH, which is being produced by the pituitary gland, is low. It also means dexamethasone can't do shit to your pituitary, um, to your adrenal gland, yeah? So it's not going to be suppressed. The serum cortisol is not going to be suppressed, even though you hit it with like a high dose dexamethasone. Because it's happen this thing's happening in the adrenal gland, yeah? So it's going to be like a Cushing syndrome, primary, adrenal, tumor, or whatever. Or it could also be like ectopic ACTH in your lung. And secondly, so if you have high cortisol, but also you have high ACTH levels, high ACTH means it's happening in the pituitary, yeah? The pituitary is going ham, and because of that, the adrenal glands are like, shit, there's so much ACTH, it must mean I need to keep producing so much more cortisol, yeah? But because dexamethasone acts on the pituitary gland, it can be suppressed. So high dose dexamethasone will work for the pituitary gland, so you will see suppression. Make sense? Yeah, cool, cool. This was doing my head in all through last year, halfway through this year, until last night. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel, I feel the feels. Normal pituitary tumor, primary Cushing's. So that could be an adrenal issue. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Diabetes, so many numbers to learn, but just learn 7 Eleven. Um, fasting, oh, I also just learned this like yesterday, but OGTT, um, it's over seven for type 1 diabetes because it's an insulin deficiency, but the level for type 2 diabetes is 11 because it's an insulin resistant thing, yeah? Um, and like signs and symptoms, what I discussed before, diagnosis, it's either you have symptomaticness, so you have your symptoms like polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss, all that jazz, or a DK or something like that, and you have at least like one abnormal BSL level reading. Um, or asymptomatic, you'll be on two separate occasions. Preferably with the same test. So if you do the fasting first time, you do a fasting next time. HbA1c, you can only do it every three months, and it gives you like an average reading of your like glucose tolerance throughout the three months. So it's re not really good for an accurate reading, yeah. Um, complications wise, you should notice it's really important. Um, macro and macrovascular. Micro, I like to split into eyes, nerves, kidneys, and diabetic patients usually know. Uh, like they see their renal specialist, they see their eye specialist, they see their nerve specialist, neurologist, and they know what's wrong with them. So like most of the ones I've met can like name their GFR, like what the value of their GFR is, that they're, they're that good with the um, staying on top of their diabetes. I also met this guy who's like, who's blind, has been amputated like a bunch of times, kidney transplant. That's a poorly managed diabetic. You don't want a poorly managed diabetic. That guy's gonna be palliated. Um, yeah, fun times. Macrovascular is all the clotty clot, clot stuff. Like AMI is clot in your heart, cerebrovascular clot in your brain, peripheral vascular disease clot in your legs. Yeah, clots. Pituitary tumor. Um, basically, all you guys really need to know is biotemporal hemianopia because it affects your optic chiasm. I'm just poking up. Um, this is the order of the hormones affected. Like, by a pituitary tumor. Um, prolactinoma is most common though. So you'll have a tumor in your prolact um, prolactin producing area and it'll result in an excessive production of prolactin. And if the tumor is big enough, it'll have mass effect causing that optic chiasm suppression. And it might also abstract your nerves. So your ophthalmic, yes, ophthalmic, trochlear and adducens. And if it's also big enough, it'll suppress the other hormones. So you'll have over-suppression of prolactin, under-suppression of the rest. Yeah? That's why you get your hormonal disturbances. Cool. Um, Charles Dex Trousseau, do you guys even notice? I'm not too sure. 
I thought you did. It's been mentioned? Sweet. It's just hypercalcemia. This is what happens. You'll see this classically like post-op, post-thyroidectomy. They accidentally took your parathyroid hormones out. So you have a hypoparathyroid level, therefore you have hypercalcemia. And you'll see this. Repro. <laughs> Not, I don't care, you don't care. Um, so what's really important here is always like, don't be afraid to ask about um, the sex stuff. So periods, PMS stuff, um, partners and specified partners. They could be multiple partners, gender or partners. Um, what else do you need to specify? Like methods, like if they're receiving or um, accepting, if it's MSM particularly. Uh, MSM is men who have sex with men, yeah? Cool. Um, for females, pregnancy, deliveries, um, all the period symptoms, yeah. Pain with the period, that's very characteristic of something. We'll go into that. Um, and then with males, ask ED, loss of libido, oh, and STIs, ask STIs and ETIs. Very important. Who have I not picked on? At the back, blue shirt guy. That's you. Hopefully this isn't you, but. You guessed see, you guessed correct. Testicular torsion. Look at you go. Um, yeah, young dude, their testes are like developing. It's the highest likelihood, like highest epidemiological group, I guess. Like I hated epi, epi second year and we hated like all that research does and Epi's just like be my savior this year though. Like if it's like a 14 year old boy with like testicular pain, testicular pain. If it's in the abdomen, appendicitis. It's just the likelihood ratio. Oh, it's amazing. Okay. Anyway, um, person next to, oh, you went traveling. Yes, you. Um, what's the answer? So the key, C, 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 yeah, C. Um, so the buzzword here is um, pain when having sex and pain on periods, yeah, dysmenorrhea, so pain with periods, and there's a family history of it, so that's endometriosis. It's like 100% a fourth year condition and they'll only expect you to identify it, they don't expect you to know anything about it, otherwise. Blood and other stuff, blood and other stuff, okay. Um, ignore this. I like to split it up into this. So, red blood, so heme, there's stuff in the blood, yeah? So it's red blood cells, blood blood cells, platelets. What can go wrong with red blood cells? You can have, either have too much or too little. What can go wrong with white blood cells? You can either have too much or too little. Platelets, same, too much or too little. And each of those has their own different sign associated with them, yeah? So who are we going with? Uh, Stephanie. Yes, I remember. Anemia, give me some signs. Signs, symptoms, okay. Symptoms, let's go with symptoms. Tiredness, fatigue, yeah. Palpitations, cool. Polycythemia, person next to second. There's like a characteristic one. Yep, uh, I was like pain in the shop, pain like under hot water, <coughs> or like, yeah, stuff like that, pruritus. Headaches on there, <laughs> I didn't know that one. Uh, okay, cool. Um, leukopenia, so that's not having enough white blood cells. Person next to, yes. Um, yeah, lots of infection. Like you'd be like tinea, asking about candidiasis, all the fungal ones. Um, it's kind of like flus and everything like that. Oh, they came up twice. Um, yeah, so in the resident and leukemia, you'd expect your B symptoms, so weight loss, night sweats, um, lymphadenopathy, have like Hella enlarged lymphoids everywhere and bone pain. Thrombocytopenia, person next to person next to person next to person. What'd you say? Bruising? Yeah, yeah. Bruising and like, it's the classic person who went to a dental, um, went to the dentist, came back like gums bleeding or like was walking around and suddenly got a, like a bloody knee. Hemarthrosis, that's very thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytosis. Yeah. So basically, stroke, 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 stroke. Oh, DVTs as well. DVTs are pain in the legs. Pain in the legs. There we go. Um, and bonus question: What are, what are the risk factors for DVT? 
smoking, good one. <laughs> Long flights, recent knee surgery, postmenopausal, all that jazz. Um, elephants up here. Um, this is a flashback to first year, I think, when I first saw this. Do you want that water bottle back? I'll, I'll give you that water bottle back. <laughs> so, like, this is a lot. I thought this was a shit ton back in first year, but you'll notice by the end of third year, so chill out. Don't worry. It'll be fine. Lymph nodes, please know how to palpate cervical lymph nodes. Like, it's a lot. It's pretty hard. It's difficult. Please be gentle as well, because I had this student who was doing um, lymph node things on me when I was teaching them, and I almost died. So, <laughs> please be gentle. And, like, I like, I like to, like, never let go of the skin, yeah? So, you're having a good feel as you're going around, and it's like a gentle, like, oval maneuver kind of thing, and you're just going along. It's like a nice massage, but you're also feeling that they have cancer. So, <laughs> cancer massage, woo! Okay, and um, mention an inguinal node, but don't do an inguinal node. You're not qualified. Okay, spleen, that's how you palpate it, that's how you percuss it. It's called the Castell spot, tent in the space, left side, because that's where the spleen is. Um, and these are some buzzwordy causes of massive splenomegaly, malaria, myeloid fibrosis, CML. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you guys know nothing about CML. It's chronic myeloid leukemia, yeah? You'll like, you'll learn a lot more about it next year. Don't worry about it. Nero. This is, <laughs> I just copied this straight out of like Wee Wings versus Pads, your first year buzzword thing. We have questions. Um, who do I want? Kai. First one. Dude, I was so confused about this while I was doing this last night. I can't remember anything to do with Ukrainian Okay, Nero. I know what H is. Yeah, H, right page on that. Um, Yep, because it's non-forward sparing and all cranial nerves affect the ipsilateral side except for trochlea, I think, is the way I thought about it. Can I pick someone? Go over here. Oh, yes. Go, Mickey. Question two. Yeah, which one? Which side? Left? Left. Chocolate is the only one that affects the contralateral side. Pick someone. Hannah. This one's like a bit hard, a lot hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the I think, and it follows down. I'll explain it after you give me an answer. What's that? Did you say anything? Sure. Okay, so um, I'd pay attention to this one, yeah? This one's pretty hard. So I'm sure you guys have this in your active learning thing. But so we'll start with the right eye. The eyes, um, the lights point to the right eye. And so we have your afferent and efferent reflex, um, afferent and efferent nerve pathways, yeah? Afferent's controlled by your optic nerve, efferent's controlled by your ocular meta. Yeah, cool. So, and that light's shining in the right eye, the afferent of the right eye, so your right optic nerve picks up on it, and it's like, oh shit, there's a light in my eye, better constrict. So your ocular meta, and your consensual ocular motor on your left side are both working because they constrict. Now it's moved to the left side of the eye. Left side of the eye, the left optic nerve's like, huh, there's a, right, there's a light in my eye? No, nah, I can't tell that. So it doesn't tell anyone to constrict, so the patient gets blinded by the left eye. So the left, ocular motor, um, the left optic nerve is not doing its job. And now we go back to the right optic nerve. Right optic nerve's like, shit, there's a light in my eye. I better constrict. Tells the ocular motor to constrict. Oculometric constricts, consensual response also works, but the left side of the oculometric constricts. So the answer is left optic nerve. Make sense? Yes, question. Um, contralateral, I'm pretty sure because the trochlear nerve, when it exits the brainstem, it comes out and it like there's a loop to loop behind. So that's the only one which has a contralateral innovation compared to the rest. Uh, and like forward sparing, they do both sides. Whatever. Just know that. Um, who was I? Hannah. Yes. Pick someone.
Brock is, yeah. I always like to think of Brock from Pokemon, who's like a strong talent type, and he's like always stuttered when he sees like um, girls. So this guy is like stuttering. And like they get really annoyed by it. But like the person I saw with Brock is, he didn't really seem to mind. He just like he just wanted you to like give him some time to work with it. And I included a little diagram which you can like enlarge and stuff. It's really good. It tells you all the different pathways. Um, do we know what anomic and global and everything else means on there? Yeah, anomic means like you can't say people's names, you've got names. Global means both are fucked up. Yeah, cool. This is a lot. Um, how am I doing for 12? We might skip this, you can do it on your own time. But, oh, actually, let's do the second one. This is, this is hard. Um, who am I going to pick on Jordan? It's one of the server. Which one? Yeah, yeah, that's the one you need to know. Um, so this one, like Monash likes to give you the classic left cranial, or like ipsilateral cranial nerve findings and the contralateral motor nerve findings. But if you think about it, cerebellar signs are also ipsilateral, yeah? And this guy presents with cerebellar ipsilateral signs and contralateral motor sensory side things. So it's still a pika. How would you differentiate pika from an acre? I was confused last night, so I searched it up. And apparently, vertigo is the main presenting complaint in acre. And it's also much more rarer when compared to pika. Epi strikes again. So yeah, left pika. Um, clumsiness when writing, no one cares. Oh, lacuna stroke. Lacunas are either pure motor or pure sensory. That's how you pick a lacuna stroke. Um, that's, yeah, MCA, acre. There we go. There we go. Ta-da. Um, these two aren't strokes, but they're also very buzzwordy. You'll see a ton of Parkinson's patients next year. And they'll all be like doing this pill rolling tremor like that. And they'll be shuffling around in the rehab ward. I hated the rehab ward. It was a waste of my time and everyone's time. Okay. <laughs> Old people. <sighs> um, intention tremor, trouble with speak, wide based gait. That's all like your Danish symptoms, cerebellar disease, whatnot. This is really important. Oh, it's gone. This is really important. Know this, the homunculus thing. I just know that the legs drop over. And this is where the acre runs through. So you'll see primarily um, lower limb stuff for acre. And you'll see lower limb, upper limb, and dysphagias for MCA. And PCA is like a lot of vision stuff is what you'll see. Um, I don't think this is very important for you guys, but it's a good, like, if they're like apathetic, it's a frontal lobe thing, just know that. I don't think it really comes up for you guys, like which lobe has the which thing. This may be way too uncomfortable. Even finding a picture was way too uncomfortable. Um, just know that red reflex, normal is red. It, if you see a normal eye out of that red reflex thing, it's not normal because something's blocking, something's getting in the way of that red light reflecting back. And so it's a tumor. In a young person, it's a retinoblastoma. Oh, also, hacks. If there's a blast in front of the tumor, like a blastoma, something blastoma, Blast is young things, so it's usually occurring in children. Um, and if it's an uh, adult with the absent reflex, you're thinking glaucoma. Um, and I don't know if, like, there was this one practice question back in second year, which, like, had the different lenses and what they correlate to. So I just put it up there just in case you guys need it. Oh, I hate this. Renners and Webers. Um, read this guy's comment. It was really good. It explained everything. I'm going to try to replicate it. Um, so Renners, Renners? Test for bone conduction, yeah? So you press here, press here. Oh, not press here, move it here. And normal is if you can hear it still. So because air conduction is supposed to be better than bone conduction. If there's a problem with that, you have a conductive issue. And that means somewhere along that auditory tract, the auditory canal, you have a ruptured tympanic membrane or your ossicles are fucked up, something like that. Yeah? And to either confirm that, or, but if they're both normal, you can still have sensory neural loss. So how are you gonna find that out? You use Webers. So you put it on top here, and the principal rule is, if there's sensory neural loss, the side affected, like you hear it's softer. And if there's conductive nerve issue, or conductive issue, so in the actual tract, there's a ruptured tumetic membrane or something, the lab side's the one that's affected, yeah? So 
how do you differentiate these? So if you have, oh, everything's normal, yeah? You put the web is on, but it localizes this side. That means there's a sensory neural issue this side. If you do Renee's and this side's fucked up, it's a conductive issue, and you do Weber's and it localizes this side, it confirms the conductive issue. Yeah, makes sense? Cool, cool. So that's basically Renee's and Weber's. This was off Murtage's GP thing. Pretty good. Read it. Um, who do I pick on? Old guy. You. I just do all of it. Like, just fill in the blanks. Yep. Yep. Plantus. It's a plantar reflex. It goes up. Everything goes up in upper motor neuron. Everything goes down in lower motor neuron. But initially, an upper motor neuron thing can present as a lower motor neuron thing. So you have hypotonia, hyperreflexia initially. But as the episode progresses, and like in a couple of days, everything will be hyper. Upper motor neuron is like strokey. Lower motor neuron is like a nerve lesion. Yay, nerve lesions. There's a lot to read. It's a pain in the ass. Um, just know brown saccade syndrome. Monash likes it. Um, it's just our loss of motor. It's also someone who can't control their bowel um, incontinence. Can't control their continence. There we go. Um, yeah, contralateral spinal thalamic tract issues. Good prognosis, but Monash likes to pick on it. Psych. Oh my God. Um, just know the difference between affect and mood. Affects like how you think that person's feeling. Mood is like how they're actually feeling. Like you may think I'm having a great time up here. I am having a great time. <laughs> um, yep, speech, judgment, that's all the MMSC stuff. Okay, who are we picking on? Wilson. Wilson, look at me, Wilson. Look at me, Wilson. I'm picking on you. This is like me. I have this, I think. <laughs> this one also comes up a lot in your questions, practice questions. So, important to know this one. Flight of ideas? Yep, flight of ideas. Pick someone. Person next to Wilson. Throw under the bus. I can't remember when I did this question, but um, it's not Paul and Hanson. I mean, it might be Paul and Hanson, but maybe not. Possibly. Is that delusion? Yep, because she's wrong. And she thinks she's right, but she's wrong. That's what a delusion is. Um, pick someone. Person above you. So it's not a mood because you think that he's depressed, but do you know if he's depressed? He knows if he's depressed. He's probably not. Probably. <laughs> um, next one. It's kind of a sad story, but most patients in rehab are like this. What's that? Yeah, yeah, an auditory hallucination because she thinks she hears her loved ones, but they're actually all dead. Sad ones. How are we doing? Oh my god, so much to go. Cardio, um, paid cops, aortic stenosis, very buzzy. Like of the murmurs, you should like for next for sure for next year, you should know aortic um, stenosis and mitral regurg like the back of your hand. Um, we will pick on. I've lost a person with the blonde hair. Yes, you look at me. Yes. Oh, there's so many people calling him, but yes, you. <laughs> D, yep, right intercostal space, breathing out, not in. Do you guys remember with which ones are out and which ones are in? Like the ones, the, the ones in are in, one out, out, yeah, cool, 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 cool. Um, oh, I'm going backwards. Yes, pick someone. Pick someone. Other blood dude, nice. 
What what type of chest pain is it? If I gave you the option of, I don't know, I can't give you any options, I'll give it away. It's a sharp stabbing chest pain. Pleuritic? Is that what you said? Pleuritic? Yeah, it's a pleuritic chest pain. Oh, shit. Um, well, pleuritic characteristic of pericarditis. Central thrusting, radiating to your neck or your arm, AMI, most type of time. Um, upon exertion, if it's chest pain, it's probably just angina. Also, you guys will learn it's a spectrum from stable angina to unstable angina to end stemmies to STEMI. So it's like a progression depending on how occluded your coronary arteries are. Yeah? So a complete STEMI is a complete occlusion of the artery, whereas angina is like a 70% occlusion of the artery. So it's just the accident waiting to happen. Um, pick someone for infective endocarditis signs. Person in the middle, why isn't your hair blonde? I should feel bad. Oh, yeah, nice. Um, this is like, I like splitting them up into embolic, infective, and knowledgeable signs, but they're kind of all, like, all in your hands, really. Okay, so embolic is like, a, like so infective endocarditis really is like an infected valve. And the infected valve grows vegetation on it because of the bacteria, yeah? And as the blood passes through, the, um, the vegetations, they flick off and form emboli. And those flicky offy bits, they travel all the way in your systemic circulation. Some end up in your brain causing mini strokes. Some end up in your fingernails causing little splinter hemorrhages. Some end up on your palms causing Janeway lesions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, makes sense. So embolic signs, splinter hemorrhages, Janeway lesions, immunological signs. So that's the vegetation being interacting like with your immune system, so your body antigen complexes, and those complexes deposit, deposit in your palms and they're known as Oslo's nodes. And they're painful because ow for Oslo's. Um, and your infective symptoms are just like fever, chills, shakes, malaise, all that jazz. Makes sense, everyone? Cool. Heart failure. This is very important because if they don't have COPD, they have heart failure. That's what I've learned. Old people either have cancer, COPD, or heart failure. Or the trifecta. Whoa. Um, could I get someone to give me presentation of right heart failure? You. Right heart failure. Yeah, yeah. So like your right heart's not pumping as effective. So you're just going to get back up of venous fluid, venous blood <laughs> fluid um so you're just gonna get just stuff everywhere in your body like ascites like ankle edema like sacral edema left heart failure can be split up into two types diastolic and systolic you guys don't really need to know about it right now but hp hfpf means preserved ejection fraction ejection fraction is of the fluid of the blood that ends up in your left ventricle how much of it is released into the systemic circulation yeah that's what ejection fraction is if it's preserved, that means the, there's still blood leaving, the same amount of blood, the same fraction of blood. And that usually accompanies like a left ventricular hypertrophy. So like it's super hard for the blood to get in. And like there's only a tiny amount of space for the blood to get in because like everything's just hypertrophy, like gotten bigger. So there's not enough space for it, but all of it that does get in gets out when it contracts, yeah? So it's a... Diastolic, preserved ejection fraction. Systolic, on the other hand, it's like a dilated left ventricle. So the shit ton of blood gets in when it like relaxes. And then when it's in systolic phase, because it's so weak, because it's so dilated, only a tiny amount of that like shit ton in there gets out. So it's a reduced ejection fraction, yeah? So that occurs in the systolic phase. Diastolic one occurs in the diastolic phase because there's not enough filling. Cool. Uh, and the presentation of left heart failure is fluid back up into your pulmonary circulation, so your lungs. So you got autopnea, PND, all symptoms of having too much fluid in your lungs. Does that all make sense? It becomes important next year, you should start getting your head around it. Yeah? Edema, different types of edema. Um, you should only really be worried if the edema is pitting, it just means it's back up of fluid. Um, I, also, it's contentious. Do you or do you not squeeze someone's car? If they might have a DVT, do you want to dislodge a clot? I don't want to dislodge a clot, but I also want to pass my oscites. 
So, you know, each to their own. Passes. Um, I'm not, oh, I might go through one ECG maybe. But um, radial, you're looking for rate and rhythm. Parodids, you're looking for character volume, yeah? And in, radi um, in radial pass, you're also looking for, like you mentioned it in vitals, radial radio delay, characteristic of either pediatric um, condition of coarctation of aorta or a adult thing of like an aortic dissection or something. Um, carotid bruits are fun. They are a feature of like severe aortic stimulation. Just remember that. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a copy. Thanks, yeah. Um, you, can, you can read that in your own time about how to read an ECG. We'll go through an ECG though. Um, so I'm, oh, I don't have time to go through it. I'll just give you what the diagnosis is. Actually, Pamud, you can give me what the diagnosis is. I'll give you the salient findings. You find an irregular, irregular rhythm with no P waves. What are you thinking? Atrial fibrillation, person next to Pumud. You find global ST elevation. What are you thinking? Pericarditis? Pericarditis. <laughs> yeah, I have pericarditis. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so, a STEMI, you either see anterior, oh, unless it's like a triple, pep, like a triple coronary and, um, artery STEMI, which is like, it's possible. But pericarditis, you'd see ST elevation in all your leads. AMI, you'd see elevations in the arteries that are affected. So like um, inferior coronary artery, you'd see the inferior lead. So two, three, and AVF. Anterior, you'd see V1, V2, V3, V4, et cetera, et cetera. Lateral, you'd see V5, V6, and V4 maybe. MSK, oh my God. Hey, remember that first <laughs> little limb lecture I did? Ah, no. Um, yeah. Oh, I actually met DJ Sanji. Like, D Sanji. He was my intern. So cool. I'm at like that moment, that goal moment. Um, who have I not picked on? I feel like I've picked on everyone. Time to do a re Have I picked on everyone? No, I haven't picked on that side. That's in the board ball. Yes. I make fun of Annette way too often. Uh, yep, radial nerve, because I am unable to extend my wrist. So I look like this. I have a wrist drop. Yeah, so my radial nerve, that's affected. Um, it also runs along the groove of the humerus. So that's where, I mean, an answer that's strong. But <laughs> maybe he might break my humerus. Um, person next to you. Tell me what's happened to Harsh. What's Harsh done here? Oh, this is really, really like re a really shit question. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a, it's not a bad question. It's a hard question. E, nice. It's E because, so I'm going to demonstrate right now. So his hip is dipping to the left, so dipping this way. So it's his left, it's his right gluteal, um, superior gluteal nerve that's not working, but it's also his right gluteal medius, gluteus medius muscle, which is innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, which isn't working. Yeah, cool. Person next to you, hi. You can just skip to like the last sentence. Possibly. And? Yeah, all three of them. Nice. So, do you know what the order is? Which ones get first? This is like first year knowledge. So, you probably don't remember. But it's MCL, medial meniscus, ACL. So, from out to in is the way it gets affected. Yeah? Sweet. Oh, I might finish on time. I probably won't. Bonji, Bonji, where are you? I haven't picked on you. Answer your own question. What happened to you? What's wrong? Fight me, Bonji. 
Oh, wait. Yeah, it used to be David. I changed it to Bonji, but I forgot to change it to both sides. Yeah, so it's, it can be both. D? Decent city? Yeah, it's correct. Oh, wait, what'd you say? <laughs> yeah, B. B is also correct. Um, because <laughs> the Achilles tendon, what it does is it dorsiflexes. Yeah, yeah. Dorsi? Plantiflexes? It plantiflexes. Yeah. So if you don't have an intact Achilles tendon, you won't be able to plantiflex. Person next to Bungie. It's your question. Throw back to back exam. Back exam is like the most useless exam in the world, but I think we might have been assessed on this once. Yeah, A? Nice. So it's A because if you, if you rotate just by standing up, you can put your hip into it and it doesn't really isolate the thoracic um, spine. So if you're sitting down, you can't use your hip. So that's, that's all you can do, yeah? It like limits you, yeah? Cool, so that's the correct way to rotate, or to assess rotation. And undifferentiated presenting complaints. Fatigue, read it in your own time because I want to do some infectious disease with you if that's possible. Um, there's a bunch of different symptoms and whenever I get some OSCEs, I get so mad because it's always cancer and I'm always like, it might be TB, it might be anemia. Weight loss, almost always cancer, especially if it's like an old dude, colorectal cancer. Um, fever, you can split this up into infection, inflammation, um, autoimmune connective tissue disorders. You'll learn a lot about connective tissue disorders next year. You'll learn a lot next year in general. Like, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, and cats, yeah, cancers and cancers. Cool, um, can I like just grab a Word document? Will that work if I open one up? I don't know how to do that. Just, just here. Here? Oh, this is like new. Google Doc. Oh, I'm so good. <laughs> nice. Okay, so infectious diseases. You need to know a couple of each and the rest is just Oh, it's just the rest. Okay, so there's three you need to know for gram positive cock eyes. I heard, I saw someone on the meme page who was like, purple is positive because purple's a royal color, which is really good. I like that. Oh, that was good, I think. That was really good. I, I, I remember that because of that. But um, I, I, I think I used to remember it as purple is a longer word than pink is, and positive is a large number than the negative number. So pink, purple is positive, but whatever, each your own. So positive. Cockeyes, yeah? There's three of them. Staph, strep, enterococci. Enterococci is your gut bacteria. Entero means gut, go figure. Um, so staph and strep are like the main ones that you guys need to know. So it should be learn positive cockeyes, you should be fine. But positive cockeyes, you give penicillin. So that's like your amoxicillins. And if you're resistant to penicillin, you give erythromycin. But if you're allergic to erythromycin like me, you're fucked. So that's that. Um, staph is resistant to penicillin, so you give them flu clocks. Flu clocks are I'll just say flu clocks. And if flu clocks doesn't work, so you have an MRSA, a methicillin resistant staph aureus, you give them bank. Wow, so simple. Positive. Um, what's, what's the other one? Bacilli. I can't spell. Positive. This, uh, I, there's like five of them. This is the hardest section, I think. It's like you don't even use these on day to day practice. So you have the cell series. Just know that word. It probably will never come up, but I'm trying to spell it. The cell series. Yep. Um, your clostridiums. So this is your clostridium difficile and clostridium perfringens. C. diff, you see nosocomially. C perfringens, you hope you never see that because that's necrotizing fasciitis and you don't want necrotizing fasciitis. Why want necrotizing fasciitis? No. Um, I don't know how to spell perfringens. I think that's it. Um, and you have listeria and you have corny bacterium. 
Haha, what a funny name. Um, and you have Nocardia. That's all you need to know. Gram positive bacilli. And what do we say about positive bacteria? Penicillin works for them. And if penicillin doesn't work, try erythromycin. Penicillin. Oh, next. Gram negative cocci. Negative, negative, fuck. Negative cocci. There's only like two of these you need to know. The nice, um, nice areas and the Moroxella cateralis thing. So, Neisseria, I'll say N, meningitides, which is meningitis, go figure. And um, Neisseria gonorrhea, gives you gonorrhea. Wow. And you also need to know Moroxella cateralis and Haemophilus. Haemophilus is, it gives you pneumonia. And Moroxella cateralis, I'm pretty sure it gives you a typical pneumonia. Don't quote me on that. Um, gram negatives. What do you give gram negatives? You give them keftriaxone or gentamicin. Keftriaxone in the hospitals. Um, we prefer keftriaxone because it has a better side effect profile. Gentamicin, you guys learned about that strict gentleman who can't hear. And so, so they have hepatotoxicity and autotoxicity associated with that. Um, a, I, ED, ED consultant, no, a CC, ICU consultant asked me why. And I was like, Fuck, I don't know. But apparently you have the same receptors in your kidneys as you do in your ears. So if it affects your kidneys, it also affects your ears. And because your ears affected, you also have balance issues because it's the same pathway, yeah? Wow. So for non-negative focus, kef, triaxone, first line, plus, yeah, okay, let's say first line, for your knowledge. And what's the other one I said? Gent. Gent. And guess what? Everything else is gram negative. Bacilli. Uh, for your knowledge, yeah. As like much as you need to know, it's gram negative bacilli. So this is like your E. coli's, oops, shit, I can't spell. E. coli, which you give trimethoprim for, Pseudomonas, aeruginosa, which you give, uh, you guys need to know, don't need to know this, but you give Piptaz, Piptacillin and Tazobactam. Um, and you also have Klebsiella proteus in here. Um, and lastly, okay, I did say this was the last one, but jokes on you, atypicals. You have um, mycoplasma and legionella. What's a buzzword for legionella? Air, yeah, air cones, office worker, Philadelphia, sure. I haven't heard of that one. And you give, is it thromycin for that one? You give Doxy for this one. Doxy also works for malaria, prophylaxis though. And that's basically all you need to know. That's infectious disease in a nutshell. This is what a reg taught us. Well, no, a consultant. Infectious disease consultant taught us. And like, because it's a new specialty, everyone's like new and like young for infectious disease. And so they actually know stuff compared to the old consultants. So it was like, oh, we're so good. But yeah, that's it. I'm out. And on time.